Uh, we're going to move to our panel and the subject of the conversation is the call of the contact centre. Do operators still need them? And I'm delighted that I'm going to be joined by, um, <clears throat> excuse me, John Strand of CEO of Strand Consult, Frederick Lemming, who's Sales and Customer Experience Director at Telia, and Johan Arland, founder and CEO Jabberbrain. So welcome to you. So uh, welcome and um, thank you. Um, I must admit I was a bit mischievous coming up with this topic because I don't really understand why we need contact centers because I've been a customer of Amazon for an awful long time, but I've called them up once when my dog ate somebody's Christmas present. Anyway, on Christmas Eve. Anyway, uh, so uh, if you'd like to just introduce yourself, maybe, and then we can get going and you can explain why my thinking is wrong. Frederick, should we start with you? So my name is Frederick Lemming. I've been working at Telia with uh, customer experience and customer service solutions for more than 20 years, providing solutions to the B2B market within Nordics and, and the Baltics and other part of Europe. Okay, John. Yes, um, my background is I've been running a research company in telecommunication for the last 25 years. Um, very much focused on the sales processes, customer experience and so on. And before that, I actually was a partner in the, the largest consulting company in Denmark specializing in establishing call centers. So I was working and I've been working with telemarketing, call center services going back to 1986. That's quite a long time. It's a while, uh, it's a while. Uh, and Johan. Yes, yeah, so hi everybody. Well, I am Johan Alon, Swedish also. I've been working in the space of conversational AI for about 20 years. So I co-founded a company called Artificial Solutions about 20 years ago. And these last five years, I had the opportunity to dig deeper into the technology and working a lot with R&D in this space. And that's the foundation for Jabberbrain. And before that, many years ago, I, I was uh, uh, running a small company implementing ERP systems for large corporations. Okay, so Frederick, I think I'm going to come to you because you uh, work at an operator. And um, why do you still need call centers? How important <laughs> are they? Uh, well, I think sort of, I think it all boils down from a telco perspective and from the industry perspective when it comes to customer service, that we are running a misconception that uh, many operations are viewing call contact centers as cost centers. Mm -hmm. And actually, they need to redefine that uh, it's more or less a profit center where actually, you know, the engagement is really happening. And the underlying reason for that is that I think there is a, a wide misconception that, first of all, everything will be digital in the future. Uh, so people, there will no longer be any need to interact live and it could be more wrong. So what we actually can see, there are four different types of engagement. So there are the engagement that we need to get rid of. We need to remove the root cause for bad interaction. Doesn't that value for us? Doesn't that value for the customer? Get rid of them. And then, of course, there are interactions or engagements that need to be simplified because they add value to us, but it's a pain for the customer. Uh, and uh, then we need to automate uh, some inquiries because they are of great uh, uh, value for the customer, but it's a pain for us. And then, of course, there are engagements that are add value for both customers and us. And then, of course, we need to treat them in a manual way. There's no other way that uh, uh, an, a digitalized engagement can compensate for, the, for that engagement. Uh, so we've done a, a bunch of research and what we have seen in Telia is uh, the faster we are digitalizing our engagement, the bigger the gap it becomes between the time that we are investing with our customers so looking back at statistics from, uh, from 2014 to 2020, we can see that we are spending more time with customers today in our engagement than we did uh, six years ago. 
And the underlying reason, of course, is that we have been so very good in digitalizing our engagement. So all the simple inquirements, all the simple tasks that is already taken care of because there's no need to talk to anyone. So the ones that are remaining are the most complex ones. And that is good news for us because our services are being used in a more complex environment. Uh, every household, every company is dependent on of the telco um, connectivity services. And of course, when that comes, more complexity. And there's no way an AI can fix that. Uh, so we really need to be there. So we need to turn our heads around and move from a cost, uh, cost center approach to profit center approach. And that we're gonna have a really bright future. I've just got one question. So you say that the, uh, you're spending more time with customers than you did in 2014 because uh, the questions are of a different nature now and you've managed to offload the really simple stuff that no longer requires a call. I'm just wondering about in terms of volume though, has the volume fallen or has it increased because there are more services? Uh, and of course, I mean, then uh, you need to define what do you mean by volume? If you, uh, if you define volume in terms of interactions uh, with us, uh, regardless if it's physical, digital, uh, over email, mail, or live engagement in the uh, customer service, there has been an exponential growth. We've never had this many interactions with our customers. But if you are referring to the interactions that is manually handed by our yeah. operation, uh, then there has been a reduction of, for us, a ballpark figure of 30% for the last wow. six years. But at the same time, the uh, reduction in agents, the staff, has been uh, in between 15 and 20 percent. And that's what I'm referring to, the, the, the gap in between. The total handling time is deviating. And the faster we are digitalizing our operation, the bigger the gap it will become. So we need to really understand this, that the future will be more complex. And we need to really redefine uh, the role as an agent, uh, we need to fight attrition, we need to find and supply them and compensate for all our legacy IT systems. So we need to have like a digital butler that is supporting them and making their operation easier and smoother. And then of course, we need to have a, a clear knowledge strategy. Did you know that in average, a knowledge worker working in a contact center service is spending six hours per week looking for gathering and complying and assessing different knowledge sources when they are communicating with customers. I couldn't think about a, a bigger waste than looking for information. And that has to do with a telco's lack of, and I'm talking a general understanding now about all telcos, uh, a lack of a knowledge strategy. So there okay. are things to improve. But that's quite amazing actually, six hours looking for information. Uh, that doesn't work with my, the thing I said at the beginning, which is the number one rule of doing business is to be easy to do business with. That sounds like it's painful. Um, John, I'm wondering what your thoughts on, on the call centers are and where they should go. I not. think the telecommunication industry in many countries around the world are light year behind what we see in other industries. Uh, let me take a very good example. Do, do we buy, when we buy airline tickets or holidays, do we go to a travel agent? Travel agent is dead, stone dead. And it's actually, it's more complicated to buy a flight ticket than buying, uh, than buying a mobile subscription. It's very much more simple products, a mobile subscription than a flight ticket. It's same booking a car on the internet. I've just basically just booked a car, uh, uh, a rental car online. Um, you know, you don't call a call center to book a car, you do it by yourself. Um, it's quite interesting to see if you look across the world, and I work in Latin America, US, Europe, Asia, Africa, and look at it, who's best in class. And to be honest, the best in class was actually invented in Denmark by the no frill discount MBNOs, which basically went out and said, we just offer a simple product, a SIM card with some traffic. You can only buy it online. We don't subsidize phones um, and everything is handled online. You get your subscription online. They drag the money. They take the money from your credit card every month and all those things. You do nothing. If we look at those no frill MBNOs, which started in Denmark with Telmo and CPP, has spread across the world, even players today like Leica like and Labara. Uh, which are going for the ethnic segments. We still, of course, have a lot of sales in physical distribution channels, but they have a, 
a, a big part of their sale online, we can see we can see that those companies basically have compared to traditional operators significant higher customer satisfaction. They have less calls to their call centers, and and basically the business case is significant more profitable than a traditional operator. Of course, the operators is handling bigger customer bases. Um, uh, they are handling also some segments which don't have not moved online yet. But I, if you look at what's happened here during the pandemic, a lot of the people who was suffering from this digital dyslexia basically we got a crash course the last one and a half year. And I think even lots of even old people, which was not so good at doing things online, can do things online today. So I think if I look at what you can reduce in costs moving forward as a telecom operator, just by handing the having structured the process, handing them digital when people buy a subscription, when they renew the subscription or when they pay for the subscription and all those things, having good online systems, um, then I think you have a, a huge possibility. And if we look across the world, the discount nose, real MNOs have been copied all the world. In Germany, you have, um, you have uh, Simio, which copied Telmo CPP business models. You have a MyaSim in Australia. You know, the list of operators which have gone down that or MBNOs which have gone down that path is huge. In Denmark today, more than 60% of all mobile subscribers is online, 60%. And basically those customers nearly don't call the call center. It's very limited uh, when they call together. I mean, remember the numbers from Telmo in Denmark, they had, I think, less than 100 people in their call center when they had uh, no, in the whole company, sorry, when as an MBNO, when they had more than half a million customers. And that, that's what's including administration, the secretary, the PA for the CEO, uh, the PA for the CEO uh, was also the, the guy who was sitting at the reception. So, so that's how it was working. So I think there's a lot of money to be saved in this. And of course, then you can say when then people need some help, then we come in and talk about uh, digital solutions like uh, chatbots, intelligent chatbots, AI solutions, all the things which uh, Johannes working with, which basically can say we can avoid to talk to people. And, and we can see that, that basically customer satisfaction among customers which are using digital solutions very often significant higher than those who talk to, to a physical customer care. Machines can actually deliver a better service than humans. Okay, so um, you're going to get your right to reply in a minute, Frederick. But first, should we talk to um, Johan about um, what you think some good solutions are here that take the weight away, take the weight off telcos, but also deliver greater, better service to customers? Now I have I mean, four four main points uh, where okay. I think we can improve a lot, and the main one is is. What, what happens when we introduce new technology, you know, we tend to focus on the technology, okay? I, I'm a tech guy, I love tech, you know? but I think what is important, if we want to build better customer service, we need to focus, always make sure we focus on the customer. Okay? I will come back to this later. You know? I also believe that it's not the either or, it's not that we have to automate. No, we have to use technology to make our people more efficient. You know? And some of the service we can automate, some of it we can use technology to improve the way that people deliver service. I'm a strong believer in moving, trying to move that control of technology away from our tech teams, closer to the customers, so therefore to our business and content people, right? because they are the ones that really understand the, the clients, they have a relationship with our customers. Right? And fourth, the last point, I'm not sure if we have time to enter in that, but I believe one of the problems we are seeing here, why, why big companies are moving too slowly, is that the way that call center services are being contracted. I will come back to that. So if I dig a bit deeper in the details. No? So when I say that we should always focus on the, on the customer, there is a tendency that when we are dealing with a situation, we are very focused on what information do we want to give the customers. And that's the wrong starting point. No? The starting point should always be, 
that we force ourselves to think, okay, who is this customer and what is their situation? You know? What is happening in his mind? You know? What is he thinking now? And that is how we need to build our service. Okay? I know, it's like phoning certain, certain contact center and they ask you what your customer number is. And I'm like, why do I need a 20 digit customer number? I've just given you my phone exactly. number. Exactly, perfect, perfect. And you bill me. So, and yeah. then I remember being woken up at eight o'clock one Saturday after a party and being asked um, what I, which numbers I'd like to put in my friends and family discount thing. And I'm like, why are you asking me? Yeah. You've got the data. Exactly. And it's also that you might not have any interest in that, what they're talking about. Especially not eight o'clock in the morning after a party. Absolutely, I agree. I agree. No, no. So it's, it's a good point. So I think that that whatever we do, when we decide to implement technology, or when we implement technology, especially when it's about an automated service like an automated dialogue, we always have to think about what is the situation of the customer. What do they think? What makes sense for them to happen in the next step? Okay. Okay. So Frederick, I'm just wondering what you think. What you're going to say about why you feel you still need support support um, contact or customer call centers so much. I mean, and, and, yeah, and, and the obvious reason is because, I mean, uh, and that is what it boils down to. Uh, we need to pair, we need to be data driven, but, uh, and, and a lot of companies claim they are data driven, but what they are missing out, they're not insight driven. They're not asking themselves, why are customers contacting us? And a lot of, and historically, the engagement has been gap fillers, as John is uh, addressing. I mean, poor processes to, you know, buy uh, online services. Uh, you know, why should you talk to anyone? I, I fully agree. So we really need to have a good understanding why customers are contacting us and uh, have this approach that I talked about, try to classify and, and work on the four different sort of approaches. Um, and, and, and basically, I mean, I would say that the strategy is that, you know, keep customer in self-service. They like to be in self-service, you know, they, it's available. But I mean, you can put it as simple as this, good self-service is good customer experience. Bad self-service is extremely bad customer experience. And, and then of course you need to have this CX strategy. And now I'm talking not from just a telco perspective, yes, came from a strategy meeting, one of the biggest insurance companies in, in the Nordics. And, you know, everyone says we have a CX strategy. And, and then I'm asking, them, okay, what does CX stand for? Well, customer experience. Okay, can you please tell me why you have launched a chatbot? Well, um, to reduce the number of calls to our uh, call center. Okay, uh, can you please show me any of your customers that have any interest in helping you save money? And of course, that is an inside out perspective. And, and that, that is where we are failing because we are so triggered by saving cost that we are launching and believing that we could launch a self-service application that would take the load off the customer service. As exactly as Johan is addressing, we are too tech driven and not doing as Steve Jobs said, you know, you have to start with the customer experience and work backwards towards technology. So we're having a technology first approach and, and that will fail. And, and here, I mean, there's a buzz in the market. Everyone is talking about AI. And did you know that there were, uh, I think it was two years ago, there were some scientists that conducted an IQ test on some traditional AI engines. And they ended up that the AI uh, couldn't match the intelligence of a six-year-old. And then you put that into that concept and context and none of us would even think about bringing our six-year-old, putting that one into, you know, um, first line and starting to engage with um, our customers. And then everyone said, no, because I need to train it and tell it what to say and how to behave exactly. And does, does that end after one week's introduction program? No, that's a lifelong engagement. Okay, what kind of organization have you set up in order to cater for the tender love and care that is needed for AI and to, you know, educate it and train it and then it seems, well, you know, we put it on top of someone else's already, you know, jammed agenda. And what will happen then? Of course, it's going to be, um, you know, a, an AI that doesn't have the full potential. And, and I, I can show you, I mean, extremely good results of the digitalization of engagement that we have conducted uh, within different industries. And we are driving a strong self-service agenda. 
But um, I, I think the misunderstanding and the big danger is that we're underestimating the tender love and care needed in order to have uh, and produce good self-service application. And we're also overestimating the uh, capabilities of AI today. Hmm. Uh, and here it's so super important that understanding what kind of services are suitable to digitalize and what services are not suitable to digitalize. And that has to come with complexity and our ability to have backend system that is supporting the entire customer journey. If you don't have those pieces of the puzzle in place, then it's going to be super hard to do uh, uh, digitalization strategy of, of all the engagement. And, and that's the boring fact. Okay, John, I can see you clearly have some views on some of Frederick's comments. I think it's, I think there's so many low hanging fruits and, and I basically for like three, three years, I was traveling around the world doing workshops on CXO level for operators, uh, telling about the no-fill discount MVNOs and how they was running their business because we did a number of case studies of them. And I did a lot of those workshops in emerging markets like Brazil and Chile, um, Mexico, um, Africa, South Africa, and so on in Asia. And, and there was a lot of prejudice in regarding what can you do and what can you not do. And, and let me just start with one end and saying, look at the cost. So in many countries, you still have very high, you have a very high percentage of customers which are prepaid customers. And people, the top up cost in many countries can be very high because you have expensive dealers which get a very high dealer commission for handling these top up costs. Of course, operators have been able to in many countries to drive them down to a couple of percent, three or four percent, five percent, but you still have countries where you have very high top up costs. I think the most expensive country I've been to when it comes to top up cost was South Africa, where the top up cost was close to 25% of the ARPU, uh, wow. particularly when we talk about the, the, the low end top up, if you could say like that. And what I'm always saying is, why don't you get starting getting your customers migrated from, from um, a retail top up to a credit card top up and to an automated top up where people basically say, deduct a certain amount from my credit card uh, when my balance reads a certain sum and so on. Be because we know that means lower churn and so on. And then your top up cost, of course it's a credit card top up cost, but that is in many countries between one and a half and two and a half, maybe 3%. So that way you can reduce, we have see I've seen cases where you, if you could migrate your customers or you could just reduce the top up cost from, we talk about the most expensive countries like 20% or a lot of countries like 10, between 10, 11, 12% when we talk about retail top up to like two or 3%. And I remember I did a workshop for a very big operator in Brazil and they said, oh yes, but people don't have credit cards and so on. I said, listen, Brazil is one of those countries in the world where people have, most people have a credit card, a bank card. Of course it's debit cards, but you can put that into the system handling that way. So just doing that is a way of taking your customers on the digital trip or where you basically say, we start doing the top up, do that electronically. If they can go to the website, they can log in on the website with their phone number and a pin code, which they get on an SMS on their phone, type in their credit card information or debit card information, say when my, when my balance hit a certain level, uh, deduct that amount for my account um, and so on. And if they instantly send the fund on the, the card, you can send the card from a text message or you can try again two days later or three days later and so on. If you I do that, you, then you can you sorry. basically can start taking the customers on a trip. And even your postpaid customers, you can do the same because you can say to them, yeah, you can pay, you can get your bill electronically, you can get an email with your bill in, you can pay it, we can pay do automatic pay, which we draw draw uh, drag the amount from your credit card or your bank card. So in that way, you start taking customers. And what we can see is that customers, which goes on the, on the starting and doing these digital, uh, taking going on these digital trips, they basically also try to find information on questions on the operator's website before they call the call center. So the same way as we do, 
we all basically have an issue with our airline company or car rental company or hotel where we book it. We try to find information on the website because we know that's easier, more convenient than calling the call center. And, and I think actually there is so many opportunities which not only is a way to educate your customers to go on this trip, but it's also opportunities where you can reduce costs, you can increase profitability, and you even can reduce churn. So I think that there's a lot of operators which are stuck in, oh, we can't do this before we have renewed all our IT systems and we cannot do this before and all those things. Even if you are stuck with an old billing system, which is, is, is a nightmare from last century, um, there's still possibilities. Definitely, there's a lot of low-hanging fruits where you can build simple digital solution, which costs you nothing to do on top of, of, of your existing platforms. And, and, and just migrating prepaid customers to uh, credit card billing operators across the world can save billions of euros or dollars, whatever you want to say. And as you say, reduce churn. So, Johan, you're, if you'll forgive me for saying so, your sort of focus has been on the sort of thing that John's describing, filling the gaps, the obvious things that drive people crazy and make them phone the call centre. Yes, but yes, I mean, there are, but again, I'm, not, I'm, I'm very careful about not saying we should just automate, no? I okay. keep repeating that, that it's so important that we look at this at, as a combination of technology and people. No? So, and that can be done in a way that we put the technology in between the customer and the call center, or it can be in parallel to the call center. So the call center people can, can be more productive and get, give better service. No? And if you then combine that with pushing the control of the technology away from the tech team and closer to the content business people so that they can build and maintain their solutions. Because that, that is how these solutions work today. You know, this is not, we don't, the telecos keep complaining, oh, we have all our legacy systems. Yes, you have, but why are you building new legacy systems then? No? Why, don't you, why don't you start acting like, like any other modern company? No? Give the tools to the people that are close to your customers. No? and let them then work because they are the ones that understand what the customer wants. They are the ones that knows when there is a new need. I like somebody's observation to me recently how fast systems become legacy these days. I think basically once you've got them out of the packaging really. Um, if it's okay with you, should we go to some of, uh, we've got some good questions here. So uh, if we could tackle them, if that's okay. So uh, one of our um, attendees says that large telcos and tier ones come with loads of legacy. I think we'd all agree with that. And that's driving having to have contact centers to manage the influx <coughs> of customer queries. Excuse me. So this large technical debt in IC, uh, IT landscape needs to be cleared first and it costs a lot and would take two to three years. Well, I mean, you're arguing you don't have to get all that out of the way to, and so is John, to make instant, almost instant improvements. Yeah. Just do it. It's, it's, I, I, I think it's like this. I, I, I hate these stories that we are stuck with an old billing system or we are stuck with old IT systems or we are stuck with and all that. If I can see that if just look at what it takes to, if you want to make a nostril discount MBNO like Telmore, CBB or Simio and so on, you can go out and buy a standard billing, customer care, whatever platform for a very low price, pay as you grow, I don't know, 10 euro cents per subscriber per month in, in, in running costs and you'll be up running in no time. And you basically, there you have the, the basic fundament. It, it, it's it's there's so many possibilities to do things. I think that that starting looking at the most, the, 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 the oldest and the most shitty of your IT system and say that is, is, is keep me from not doing anything is absurd. Start, go out and, and do a mapping of your customer, the customer experience. What does it take to go and buy the product on a website? What does it take to go and buy the product in the retail store? How long time does it take? What does it cost? Analyze the whole sales process, analyze all the processes, 
put numbers on it and put the processes uh, in, 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 into a spreadsheet where you say, this is the time it takes to do these different processes. This is a cost by handling this process and so on. And then look at those where you basically can gain most and then go for the low hanging fruit. Frederick, I'm sure you have these thoughts and many others. It's a case yeah, no, I, I, I fully, I fully agree. I mean, it, it, it's all about, uh, um, you know, um, do the things that you, you get most bang for the buck. And, and of course, you, you need to find the low hanging fruit. And, but that is often the challenge. Uh, because uh, uh, many operations are you know, not even data driven today, they are gut feeling driven. So, you know, this is a pain point. Uh, uh, maybe we should try to fix this. So aiming for the wrong services. So you need to have a clear understanding about the, the, um, the low hanging fruit. And then of course, I mean, uh, I mean, some of the telcos are not just mobile operators, they are wholesale telco. So, uh, so what we have seen and what we really like is there has been an explosion in the usage. So it's no longer just one mobile subscription, it's many, it's triple play, it's uh, TV services. And, and the good news, we like it. And the even better news is that many of the uh, services that are being used in, in households today, if you're talking to B2C, are uh, basing their existence on our connectivity services. But just the sheer fact that, you know, a lot of different technologies are working together, you know, that creates complexity. And, and, and uh, you know, so we need to understand, uh, I mean, it's dangerous to simplify the entire experience from a customer uh, because if we simplify too much then once again we will not understand how we can support and, and help the customer to a better experience and, and that comes uh, at the cost that we really need once again to investigate and invest in people that are doing the insight driven analysis and okay. I, I firmly I firmly believe with you Yuan and you know uh, uh, I think sort of uh, what telcos and other sort of customer service operation, what they need, they don't need AI that can win jeopardy because that requires 100 NASA technicians to train them. And it's too slow. I mean, this is real time business. It's happening now. You need to react instantly. And uh, the ones that understands what is being asked for and how you should respond and how you should communicate with customers are the operation themselves. Hence, you need to have AI that can be managed by the operation. And, and, and here, a lot of companies that I've seen, you know, they bought this sophisticated technology that is super, you know, that are ready to win Jeopardy or, you know, beat the uh, AlphaGo or whatever. But I mean, to be honest, they would be quite useless to, to, to use in, in this context. I've never met a chatbot that could answer my query because the exactly. query is complex. No, and I exactly. just think the chatbot but as a blocker, actually. Yeah, because there are some things that are very important is to separate between what I call clickbots, which is represents 95% of the chatbots you see. They are not intelligent. They have no or very limited interpretation capability. Mm -hmm. They are really a complex menu structure that has been dressed up to look like a chat. You know? Yes, they can provide some service, absolutely. No? But that is not what I think any of us is talking about. No? That okay. is not the road to go. No? If you want to deploy a chat, an automated chat solution, it has to be built on a, on a high quality conversational AI tool. Okay, should we look at another question? Um, one of our attendees says, that um, efficient replacements of temporarily subcontracted CSRs, and they never know the business well enough to answer questions, they could be replaced by AI, good AI bots. So I think we probably all agree on that. Uh, and it could save customers a lot of, uh, the operators a lot of money. But we, do we think that every customer interaction in the long term could be replaced? in this way by a bot. And I think probably the answer is no. <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff. Well, I'm thinking this is a great example. So if we can't provide a CSR with enough information with you know, live flesh and blood to answer questions to customers, 
how on earth do we really believe that we can train a bot to replace exactly that job? And, you know, it, it, I mean, sorry to say, but we are fooling ourselves believing that uh, the way that we should address that challenge is by replacing that with a, with a bot. Of course, what we need to do, we need to have a better understanding what the reason for the in inquiry is all about. And we need to understand what the correct response to that inquiry is. Either it can be an improved process, it could be better responses, and then we could have a discussion. Well, should this be managed by a bot or a conversational AI, as I would like to put it, or, uh, you know, a CSR? Uh, so, I mean, technology will never solve anything. Remember, it's a six-year-old you're bringing in here. You need to train it. Okay, yeah, Han. <laughs> yes, I mean, my, my, I mean, I've been working with in this field for more than 20 years now. And, and the last, I mean, the last 19 years, my, my vision has really been that the best way of giving customer service is to provide it with a combination of people and technology. You know? So that we use technology where it makes sense to automate whatever we can automate. However, there is always a person ready to take over when needed. And then also those people who are then taking over when needed to so the second line support, they are also the key people in feeding the system you know, so that we get the new question that this automatic system cannot handle. The person picks it up, solves it, and then say, oh, this I have to feed into the system. So the next day when another customer has the same or a similar question, they can get an automated answer. You know? So, 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 so the answer to the question, will we ever be able to solve all the questions? Well, I mean, not by fully automating it, but with a combination of technology and real people. Yeah. I've just, so someone asked, what are the best examples in the industry of where AI is supporting the customer journey in, in the right way? If you've got you any. I don't know. <laughs> It's probably uh, a competitive advantage for those who have it. <laughs> no, but I, I mean, I, I could respond to that. I think so. Though, uh, first of all, it needs to be a coherent experience. Uh, you need to have, uh, you know, a conversation AI, a virtual agent that is coexisting both in the voice and the text channel. You know, you, I mean, it's, you should have the same uh, service and experience uh, regardless. And of course, then you need to take into consideration that texting to someone is different uh, compared to talking to someone. So you need to tweak it. But the underlying structure, what you can do, uh, what kind of services you are making available needs to be the same. The same task needs to be able to be performed. And, and then of course, I mean, with conversation AI, you have a fantastic understanding. To give you one example on the IVR, the traditional way of addressing an IVR is many choices. And first of all, they are, extremely uh, complex and often they have the inside out perspective. Customers need to understand our internal or operation because often the many choices is mimicking how we are structured. So bad customer experience, inside out perspective. So what you need to do, you need to turn it around and you need to provide the customer with the ability, ability to talk freely uh, by themselves and explaining the inquiry. So this is the challenge that I'm having and then it's up to us to understand the intent and the underlying reason, and then provide that customer with the most appropriate uh, services that we have in hand. Could be a self-service application, could be a live engagement, could be something else. So uh, conversation IVRs are extremely good because with a traditional one, maybe you can classify uh, an inquiry in maybe uh, 20 different ways or 15 different ways, and you have a full uh, percentage of 50% because people are searing out or you know, don't understanding the menu, menu tree with a conversation IVR, you could classify an inquiry in more than 150, even up to 200 different ways. And then you have a fantastic start of the engagement because you can really be precise in how you are routing that interaction. And, and uh, I mean, that's the whole game. And I can prove you that conversation IVR is improving self-service utilization, customer experience, improving operational cost, and much, much more, and open up the door to the future. So that is the way to go, conversational AI in all forms. 
Okay, so I'm just going to read out a couple of comments from uh, the audience, and I'm afraid we're out of time. I think we could maybe talk about this, well, possibly forever, really. Um, so um, <clears throat> our attendee notes that nobody's taking decisions about product rationalization. Actually, that's not quite true. And if you want to talk to me later, I can give you some information about that. Uh, but who's accountable um, for this and recognizing that the uh, com typically complex product portfolios impact revenue. So that's one observation. And also that we rely on data, set, data scientists, but we lack the process black belts because nobody wants to do their job that's perceived as a real legacy kind of, kind of thing. Um, and consultants come and they go, but the hardcore of the problem remains. John, one final word that we have to stop, but go ahead. I'm just saying it very simple. I think the telecommunication industry should learn from the airline industry. What's happened in the airline industry, discount airline companies came in and all the classic airline companies, they basically have two choices, either to reinvent themselves with a cost structure, which can be compared with a discount airline company or go bankrupt. Numbers of airline companies went bankrupt. And if you look at, it's quite interesting to see that BT basically changed, uh, British Airways changed their approach and said, we need a cost structure like a discount airline company, but maintain our, our key brand. If I look at the under 70 mobile operators we have in our client list in our company, a lot of them is basically what we call the fat lady of the town or the fat lady in the, in the, in the class, if you could say like that. Getting on Learn from the from the <laughs> really respect. Um, I can say that I'm a fan, um, but but I I think it's important to say that that if we look at the Nostril discount MBNOs, they basically in many countries have proven that with a very slim organization, a very high digitalization, they've been able to go out and gain huge market shares, uh, and their Acquisition costs is significant below traditional operators and their customer care cost is also significant lower and their, uh, their customer satisfaction is sig significant higher. And, 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 and honestly, I think it's a bad excuse to get stuck, uh, could be stuck in the old world. And, and I think it's, uh, I think that, that uh, it's 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 sometimes embarrassing to see what some operators are spending on things where you basically can say, why are you doing these things? I, I've been doing just the, the top up cost. We did we we have we have a, a prepaid workshop concept which we've been running for numbers of operators, and I was doing a workshop for top management from from a giant operator with 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 more than fifty million customers in one country. <laughs> And, and, and basically I said to them, listen, you have so many prepaid customers and your top up cost is gigantic. And we discussed how they could change it, but it took them two years before they start to come to the point where, uh, where they change it. And look at the revenue went through their system with a high top up cost for two years. So I think it's, it's important to say that, it's important to say there is so many possibilities, but if you don't do action on it and you spend too much time on spreadsheet and talking and all those things, you know, you will end up like the old airline companies. Well, we've all seen what the pandemic did in terms of urgency and amazing what you can do if you really have to. So um, I'd like to thank all of you. I thought it was a great discussion.